Cork Church. It's uh, great to be here, to be able to open up the Word of God and um, really share uh, the truth of the Scriptures uh, with you tonight. Before I do, uh, just want to greet you from myself and Laura. For anyone who doesn't know, Laura is 14 weeks pregnant. Yay! So uh, we are expecting a baby and we're thrilled. Uh, pray with us for a healthy baby. Uh, we will be... Um, uh, Laura's due date uh, is the 3rd of January uh, next year, so pray with us uh, as we expect. I have no idea what I'm doing. Pray for me and pray for Laura. She's got two kids to put up with now. Amen. So just keep us in prayer. And we're super excited about being able to come back into the church and be with you in person, worship with you in person, sit under the word of God, under the scriptures with you and enjoy brotherly love. Amen. Enjoy love together. That's what Jesus uh, intended when he called uh, for himself out of darkness a church, that that church would know his love and that that church would um, bring forth that same love in, in the way that they relate to, to one another. So we're looking forward to excelling in brotherly love and loving uh, well when we do get back together again. Um, with all that being said, I would love to get into the scriptures with you tonight. Uh, the Lord has put a text on my heart. The Lord has given me a text and I think it's relevant. You know, what I love about the word of God is that it's timeless. Therefore, it's always timely. And the Lord has brought me to John 13 and he's brought me to verses in John 13. And I'm going to work through them tonight with you, church. I'm going to, we're going to walk through those verses and it's really all about love. Uh, the, the best way to sum up the verses I'm going to discuss is right here in verse 34 and in 35 of John chapter 13. But before I read any of the word of God, pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for truth. And we think of your words, Lord Jesus. Uh, even in John 17, you prayed to the Father. Father, sanctify them. That's believers. Uh, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. So we know that your truth has a a, a sanctifying effect, Lord. It has a way of separating us out of this world almost, as it were, Lord, of, and, 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 and a way of releasing us, Lord, into, Lord, all that you have for us, Lord Jesus. It's your word as a way of, of stoking and, and bringing us into the fullness of the intimacy that you died for us to have with the Father, Lord God. And we're just excited about that, Lord. And just help me, Lord, Lord Jesus, to share your word the way that I should, Lord, and that we would hear the gospel and celebrate, Lord, uh, truth, Lord, in its purest form. Tonight, we pray in the name of Jesus. So, John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are disciples if you have love for one another. So I'm going to talk today, and I believe that this passage is all about love. It's all about, firstly, the love of God, and secondly, how the love of God plays out in human relationships. And we're going to go through the text now, and we're going to explore the context, and we're going to see just exactly what Jesus means when he calls us to love, and then what that looks like, and then finally, what the result of brotherly love in the way that Jesus describes how that plays out, not just in us, but also in the world. So walk with me now, church. I'm going to go back to the beginning of John uh, 13, and I'm going to start in, in verse 1. Now, before the, pe the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that uh, his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Amen. Verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things, all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, 
tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So that's the first portion out of John chapter 13 that I'm going to read. And I want to explore these verses. There's tremendous truth right here in the word of God. And I want us to look at it. The first verse says this, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, back to the father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Amen. So this is Thursday night. Jesus is going to be betrayed in the wee hours of Friday by Judas into the hands of sinful men. Jesus is coming to the climax, coming to that, uh, to, to, to that place where he's going to walk in the way of the cross. He's on his way to a cross and he knows it. It's Thursday night. He's going to be betrayed and, and, and crucified that Friday, that Passover, as God's Passover lamb for the sins of the world. Jesus, the Bible says, knowing his hour had come, knowing that he was going to be betrayed into the hands of evil men, some of whom actually sat in that room with him. He was going to be betrayed into the hands of evil men uh, as a direct result of the actions of men who were actually in that room with them at that time. Covertly by Judas, Jesus chose at that hour to teach his disciples a lesson that was not only timely, but timeless. Jesus chose at that time, knowing that he was going back to his father, knowing what was, going, what was going on in the heart of his disciple Judas, knowing what was going on in the hearts of the Sanhedrin, and ultimately knowing what the plan of God was, that he would go to a cross, chose that place, that upper room, that meal, to teach a lesson that would not only be timely, but timeless. You have to agree with me. We're living in a world right now that seems to simultaneously preach tolerance and also preach violence in the way that it's separating now. There's so much talk of race. There's so much ethnic conflict. How is it that we can live in a society that preaches tolerance toward our brother in one sense, but in another sense is, is a, a, a society full of offense, a society that says, no, my brother has offended me. I'm unhappy with my brother. And somehow we, we, we're being told to be tolerant and we're being told that we actually have to be offended all at the same time. Jesus is teaching a lesson about brotherly love. Jesus is about to leave the world and return to his father. And the chief thing he's concerned, of, uh, concerned about is that his disciples would love each other after he's gone. Not in, and, it, and it goes further. It's not that we would love in our own way our brother. But Jesus goes further. He says, no, I don't just want you to love your brother. I want you to love him in the way that I show you. And so Jesus rose, the Bible says, and gave his disciples an example. He modeled for them a pattern for them to follow, to walk through. The very thing he wanted us to do after he was gone. In fact, verse 35 tells us it's the very way we will reach that outside world that is so fractured and divided by the way we love each other. So what was in the heart of Jesus? Jesus knew where he was going and he knew to whom he was going. He knew that he did not belong to this world, but the Father. And because the Father's love was in him, okay, catch me with this, because the Father's love was in him, he loved what the father loved because the father's love was in him he was able to love what the father loved he was able to love his own until the end and that 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 phrase end means to the uttermost and I want to make a point now church you can't love what the father loves until you have the glory of the father's love in you you can't value what he values until you have his love inside of you. And let me tell you, no one so certain terms uh, at church, God values people. He values his people. You can't value people. You can't love them until you first have the father's love in you. Verse 2. 
Bible says that during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. It lays that out here. There was something also going on in the heart of Judas. There was a covert betrayal. Uh, this man who'd walked with Judas for three years, uh, a, a bedfellow and friend, somebody who was entrusted in ministry to carry the water, to, excuse me, to carry the money, to carry the finances, the, the CFO of Jesus' ministry had betrayal in his heart. But Jesus was about to do something so remarkable, so uh, special and significant. He was about to demonstrate to his disciples a love that didn't require a qualification. Jesus was about to show them a love that was unconcerned with the inner motivations of the recipient. A love that wasn't afraid to be vulnerable. Jesus was about to wash the feet of Judas, a man who would betray him. Jesus was about to demonstrate a love that wasn't afraid to be vulnerable, a love that wasn't afraid to be hurt. Listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully. Round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your love will change. It will not be broken, but it will become an unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Folks, we cannot love our brother without opening ourselves up, without exposing ourselves potentially to hurt. It's challenging. It's challenging, but I believe that God wants to speak to us about loving one another now at this time because the world, I believe, is ready to listen. The world knows that something is missing and what is missing is our ability to be gracious to that brother who disagrees or differs or hurts us in some way. How to deal with offenses and stay unified in love because if there's one thing society isn't today, it's unified. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that his time had come from God and he was going back to God. Fantastic. Listen to this. And I want you to, even if you're taking notes, take notes of this. Jesus knew who he was, whose he was. Jesus knew what he, was his. Jesus knew who sent him. And Jesus knew to whom he was returning. In other words, Jesus had an identity. He was a son, he had belonging, and he was an heir. He had a portion, amen. And his identity, he got from his father, he received it, he didn't achieve it. And so Jesus, look at this, he was truly free from the value system of this world. What do all men seek ultimately? What is the value system of the world that we live in? I've got a short list, church. Power, wealth, comfort, success, and recognition. That's what, the, that's what the world lives for, seeks out, searches for, and you don't get an identity until you achieve one or a few or ultimately all of these things. You're nothing until you're powerful, nothing until you're wealthy, nothing until you're comfortable, nothing until you're successful or recognized. Yet for Jesus, this was something that he was about to put down. John 17, 5, Jesus says this, now Father, bring me into the glory we shared. The glory you and I shared, Father, before the world began. Jesus is the preeminent one, the only begotten, who the Bible tells us was in the arms of the Father. He was the exact representation of the glory of God. And all things were his already. And I want to make a, 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 a suggest something to you here. We spoke about the love of the Father. That's an inner glory. And now I want to show you that Jesus already had these outer things. He already had the power, the success, the wealth, all of it. He sat, uh, he had he shared the glory of God. He was in position uh, with God as, as the only begotten, preeminent, as the firstborn. 
He had all the outer glory. And he was about to put it down. Look at verse 4. Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. This is amazing, church. Look at this. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Wow. Just bear with me here. I want to read a well-known passage of scripture to you. It's from Philippians chapter 2. Paul calls us to have this mind that was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the very form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Some translations say he considered it not robbery. But he emptied himself. Now that word is kenosis, but I want to suggest to you that it's the taking off of the outer glory. And he took the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Church, can you see what Jesus is doing? He is demonstrating for them, even in the context of betrayal by those closest to him, a type of love completely unique, not found anywhere in creation. Jesus took off the outer garments of power, of wealth, of success, of recognition, of position, of status, and because he had the inner glory of the love of the Father, took instead a towel. Now it's amazing, that word towel, it's really suggesting an apron, which servants put on when they're about to work. He took off the outer garment, the mantle, and put on the towel. And the Bible says that he washed or he cleansed their feet with water, the feet of his disciples. Matthew 20 verse 28 says this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus literally demonstrates Philippians 2 right there at that table, the taking off of outer glory because of the presence of an inner glory. The ability to love your brother in a like manner is based on you first experiencing the love of God for yourself and knowing that inner glory. Look at verse 5. I want to talk to you about foot washing. And I've been to a couple of foot washing uh, services, actually, uh, not in this church, but in other churches. And what I find funny about foot washing is, uh, in a way, it's, it, it can feel embarrassing. It can feel, it's cringy, particularly in culture today, the idea of somebody washing your feet. But let me tell you something. It is, it, you're never more, you're ne you don't ever feel more vulnerable than when you're sitting down and somebody is actually washing the dirt off your feet. Now, if you have feet any way like mine, church, you wouldn't inflict them on an enemy. But to have somebody come and wash your feet, wash, wash that part of you in that intimate type of way, there's something about it. Now, the act had a, a cultural significance as well. At the time, it was a, a culture where people walked a lot. They wore sandals. And so when they came into a home, it was custom that their feet would be washed because their feet would be filthy uh, from walking, from traveling. It, their feet, it was the dirtiest part of themselves. And here is Jesus washing the feet of those who don't deserve it, demonstrating through the act of foot washing something. He's showing to his disciples his patient endurance, his grace toward the filthiest parts of us. A love, he's showing a love that intimately, tenderly cares for and is not repulsed by the dirtiest parts of the recipient. And the significance of this to me is amazing because it speaks to the one receiving it 
of being vulnerable, exposing the least flattering parts of who you are to your brother and also to the one doing the foot washing intimately. It's intimately and patiently caring for the most vulnerable, unflattering parts of your brother. I'm not necessarily promoting the physical act of washing feet, but I'm looking to what the act signifies. Gracious, loving kindness and patience and vulnerability from one to another. I'm going to jump to verse 12 now. Because Jesus, is, he's washed the disciples' feet. He's spoken. He's had a great exchange with Peter. And now, after he'd finished washing their feet, it says in verse 12, this, he says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done for you? In other words, know ye what I've done for you? Or do you perceive? It's to have a knowledge and to feel what I've done for you. Do you understand what this is really about in other words? The voluntary laying down of power, status, wealth, comfort, success and recognition. All rights in favor of service and then serving those who did not qualify for service and will repay your service with betrayal. Church, I believe that the Lord would have us come around this text to prepare us for a truth I think we already know. People, the people closest to us in the body of Christ will hurt us. They'll wound us deeply, perhaps seemingly fatally. They will maybe betray you overtly like Peter. I don't know the man. Or maybe covertly like Judas. And the betrayal you'll never see coming. It'll take you by surprise. They'll lift their, feel, their heel up against you. Yet if the Father's love is in you, you're free to love them anyway. Hallelujah. And what did Jesus say in the garden of Gethsemane? Friend to Judas, do what you came to do quickly. In other words, my heart towards you has got nothing to do with your heart towards me. And that's what Jesus said, meant when he said in verse 34, it's a new commandment in that it's radical. Not that we would love, everybody preaches love, but that we would love like this. It's based on a value system that doesn't come from this world. It comes from heaven. And look at verse 13. This is, I love this. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord and you're right, for so I am. And that word teacher literally means one who shows men the way to salvation. So in other words, Jesus is, oh, and it, it speaks of all knowingness. Jesus is saying, you're right to call me all knowing because I am. And that other word is kurios, meaning Lord. He to whom a person or a thing belongs. He who holds the power of a decision, a sovereign or a prince, a chief, a master of a servant. In other words, a highly exalted one. So Jesus is saying, you're right to call me all-knowing and you're right to recognize that I'm highly exalted. And look at this, folks. In the English, we miss it. It says, for so I am. But actually in the old English, it says this, you say, well, for I am. Wow. Jesus is literally using that word, uh, using the name of God. You're right. I am the self-existent one, all-knowing, preeminent, yet to, to, to do, and yet the love that he shows here is amazing. If I can do that, to love and serve without reward, without personal benefit, if I can serve those who can add nothing to me, if I can serve those who can't offer me power, status, comfort, wealth, success, recognition, if I can do that, then I can do it through you. Church, Christ needed nothing from you, and yet, Gave everything for you. What type of love is this? Christ needed nothing from us. 
and yet gave everything to us. There was nothing we could add or offer, nothing we could give the Lord, and yet he gave us everything. And yet he's patient with us and endures and is long-suffering and gracious to us. How much more should we be this way to our brother? But we have a problem in society today. Service and love isn't really about any of that. Everything we do in society actually is to garner for ourselves power, status, comfort, success, wealth, and recognition. And if the person you wish to serve doesn't offer you that, or if he has the potential to take it away, we simply don't serve that person. I have another quote here. We instinctively tend to limit for whom we exert ourselves. We do it for people like us and for people whom we like. Yet Jesus will have none of that. And in the passage in Luke chapter 15 about the Good Samaritan, Jesus depicts a Samaritan helping a Jew. Jesus could have not found a more forceful way to say that anyone at all in need, regardless of race, politics, class, and religion, is your neighbor. Not everyone is your brother and sister in the faith, but everyone is your neighbor and you must love your neighbor. And that's in response to a man who asks what the qualifications should be for love. And Jesus says, you've got it wrong. Actually, you're supposed to love without qualification. How much more than our brother or our sister in the faith? And this is the glory of Christ's love. It's purely one-sided. It isn't transactional. It doesn't require gratitude. Thankfulness on the part of the recipient. And when one is free from the value system of this world and rooted in the value system of Christ, there's a liberty to love what God loves. When his love, the Father's love is in you, there's a liberty, a freedom from the value system of this world to love what God loves. Remember verse 3, Jesus loved his own until the end. God's economy system has got nothing to do with wealth and power and status. It's got everything to do with people. Jesus says in John 15, there no, no greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. What if his friends require his life? I have another quote. I love quotes. In friendship, we think we have chosen our peers, but in reality, a few years difference in the dates of our births, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, the accident of a topic being raised or not being raised at a first meeting, any of these chances might keep us apart. But for the Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. A secret master of ceremonies has been at work, Christ, who said to the disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friendship that it's not a reward for our discriminating and the good taste that we have in finding one another out. It is the instrument, friendship, listen, brotherhood is the instrument by which God reveals to us the beauties of others. God wants you to know the beauty of your brother. God wants you to see your brother the way that he does so that you can wash his feet, you can show long-suffering, gracious love to the parts of him most in need of it. You can only put down the outer glory of this world's values when you're full of the inner glory of the Father's love. Otherwise, your relationships are purely transactional. They're about who can give you or give you power or who can take it away. But only sons can really serve sons. When you know whose you are, you can humble yourself in order to love others. Jesus goes on. Verse 14, if then you, your Lord and teacher, has washed your feet, you, ought, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If God in his self-existence can love his children like this in a non-transactional way, 
we too are to value his children as he does and follow the pattern that he laid out. And that word should is fantastic. It means to owe a debt. So we owe unto other a debt of love. The Bible says, leave no debt of love outstanding mutually to wash each other's feet, to demonstrate servile loving kindness to the most base dirty parts of our brothers and sisters. Hallelujah, we are washed. We are graciously delivered from sin. We are clean because of the word spoken over us. Yet God is bringing our natural man to a manifestation of what he's done in the spiritual places. In other words, I'm progressively becoming more like what God has already made me. Lord, help us. Jesus says in verse 15, for I've given you an example that you also should do as I've done for you. An example laid out by the master for imitation. Verse 16, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. We are not able to rise above this and redefine what love means. Society is doing that right now. We're all happy to love as long as it's on our terms. Love who we love, serve who we like, people we identify with, people who can give us the things that we feel we want or need. But Jesus is saying, no, I want you to be full of my inner law, my glory, the Father's love and inner glory. So you can love like I do. Jesus has defined what love should look like. Society doesn't get to do it. We see what happens now that society is tried. Fractured. Race wars. Socioeconomic wars. Gender divides. And yet we preach tolerance. And verse 17. Finally. If you know these things. Blessed are you if you do them. If you know, and that word know means to perceive with the eyes, with the senses, to, dis to discern, to discover, or to turn your mind's eye to a thing. You'll be happy. If you bear this fruit, the fruit of the glory of the Father's love in your relationships, you will be happy. And that word happy means supremely blessed, fortunate, well off. We're to love as he did. In other words, we're never more blessed than when we're putting up with each other. We're never more satisfied, contented, fortunate, well off than when we find the treasure that is our brother. Because that's the very love that sent Jesus to a cross. Just in closing... What's the solution? If you're struggling with the genuine reality of offenses, offenses caused, things that people have done to you, wounds, maybe it's a Judas and you didn't see it coming, but maybe it's a Peter and it's an overt betrayal. Either way, either way, what's the solution? How do we love in the manner Jesus prescribes? The answer is what we've been discussing. A knowing in the heart the inner glory of the Father's love. And here's the list. Remind yourself, refresh yourself in whose you are, what is yours, by whom you have been sent, in other words, your calling and your purpose, and to whom you will return, your expected end. And the second thing is that you would experience the love of the Son that through the body they would patiently, you would remember how he patiently endures with your shortcomings and failures so that you can continue to do it with your brother or sister so that we might be free from the value system of this world that's built on power and that we would be free to be vulnerable, no longer seeking to save ourselves from distress, from crucifixion. And what's the outcome? It's personal blessing, as we've seen, happiness, 
but also, verse 35, people will associate this love that is found, uh, that, that will associate this love. The unbelieving world will see this love for what it really is. Jesus said, all men, all people will know, will recognize that you are his disciples. Or in other words, you're students of the cross. When we apply love this way, the world will see a love that they cannot recognize anywhere in all creation. A love that is absent in society and present in only one place, the cross of Jesus Christ. When the God who created the author of life took the sins of the world, was buried on, on, on the third day and then rose from the grave. The costly finished work of Jesus that the unbelieving world will see a love that they, have, that they do not recognize a love that they cannot put their finger on save by pointing to the cross, pointing to Calvary. Oh Lord, fill us with that inner glory so that we can love like you. Let's pray together, church. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, for the scriptures. We thank you for your word. And we just pray tonight, Lord, uh, that as we go out from this place and as we return to service, as we return to, to, to the church and as we return to fellowship, help us to be prepared for the shortcomings of our brothers and sisters and help us to wash their feet, Lord, by showing gracious, loving kindness and patience. Deliver us, Lord, from being transactional. Lord God, from seeking to gain power and wealth and success and comfort as if we didn't already have an identity. Jesus knew whose he was, what was his, where, who sent him and to whom he was returning. I pray, Lord, that we would refresh ourselves in those truths so that we can care about what you care about and so that the world would know that there is a love unlike any other and it's at Calvary. In Jesus' name.